Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whichever uh, time you've chosen to tune into this particular session. Uh, this is the Festival in a Box 2.0 session with uh, myself and Paul Dempsey from Spade Distillers. Um, and he is going to take us through the bottling that he has uh, kindly included in the festival pack, which is the Speyside Fumar Cask Strength. So if you uh, identify the bottle, pull it out of the pack and uh, let's go. So let me bring in Paul. Paul, how are you doing, sir? Good afternoon, Eddie. All good here. You well? Yeah, I am. I am. I've had an interesting afternoon, as I mentioned before, but uh, glad to be here, glad to be talking to you, and I'm even more glad to be drinking your whiskey. I mean, sampling your whiskey. <laughs> it's research. It's all in the name of research. So. It is all research. That's right. That's right. So where, where, where does today find you? Uh, probably the same place I was for the last festival. So um, this is my uh, spare room stroke uh, office, stroke man cave, stroke whiskey stash. Um, <laughs> So it's 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 been. I've probably spent more time in this room in the last year than I have in the ten years I've lived here. But yeah, it's been yeah. great. I've done more whiskey stuff in the last year than I've ever done before from here. So. <laughs> you certainly put yourself about a bit, if you don't mind me saying. Without leaving the house. So <laughs> yeah, no. Um, well, let's get let's get right into it. Um, obviously, I know you very well, and we've been you know working together for many successful years but why don't you tell them um, tell the audience uh, the good folks at home who you are and what you do and just very briefly how you got to be doing it yeah sure i'm i'm paul dempsey i'm the commercial manager at space Side distillers company we produce the spay single malt range amongst a few other things i was there i've been there for seven years now prior to that i was a distributor with whiskey distilleries as clients so i had uh, Brickladdy, Bowmore, and Aaron as, as clients originally. Um, and then seven years ago, when uh, Brickladdy was sold, I uh, joined Space. So I went from being a distributor to working for an actual producer. Um, and I've been there ever since. It's, it's my job to find the people that want to sell our whiskey around the world and to get out and do the festivals, see the stores. Um, um, but with it being a small company, we get to have a say in you know the new releases and things like that so, so it's a lot more fun than than uh what i knew about whiskey beforehand so indeed indeed well of course we'd much both of us would much prefer to be together in the same room uh drinking and drowning but um until until that's safe this 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 will have to do and uh yeah. i hope you guys at home are having a having a, a good time but a safe time um, so anyway, tell us um, tell us about the bottling that we're about to taste. Okay, uh, the, the bottling we've got today it's a little bit unusual for for what our distillery normally do. Um, we have uh, a peated whiskey in our range called Fumari. We use the Latin term, I think, because we're a fairly new distillery, so everybody beat us to the Gallic names. Um, but what we've got here is a cast strength version of that, which we we produce usually one or two batches a year of. 1500 bottles per batch you've got the bottle on screen there we've got batch number two today um and you will find it um see it's up on the caption massive mall good independent whiskey shops uh we're now you you might find batch number three out there or batch number two they're very similar batch number two is what we have today um and uh yeah i, I like these because with it being small we can you know there's always new ones coming along but it's a it, it surprises a lot of people. One because of the strength, and two because it's a peated whiskey from a distillery that's not well known for it. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so you guys actually do use peated malted barley rather than peated casks, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's <clears throat> there's only fifteen hundred bottles of this, um, and we don't produce with peated barley all year round. It's usually for a week or two at the end of the the season. Um, so I think think like Balveni with their peat we, we we're similar. Um, so uh, we're always going to have a limited supply of this, um, but it uses the same cask stocks that we use for the other whiskies. So it's not a peated cask. That's maybe an experiment we should look at at some point in the future as well. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting because obviously there's a lot of um, distilleries out there who use peated casks almost as a precursor to using then peated single malt. 
the barley, whereas you'd be doing it the other way around, I guess. Yeah, and it is, like I say, it's, I mean, Finlay, our distillery manager, he works with us just for a couple of weeks a year. Distillery closes down twice a year for, for maintenance. So it's a perfect opportunity before that happens to to experiment with different things. And one of those things that they've, they, 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 they play around with is the barley. Um, so we will buy in peated barley rather than than um, our standard unpeated. Uh, same mm. supplier, crisps at Port Gordon, so in the northeast of Scotland. Mm. Um, but um, yeah, we, we've been releasing the peated whiskey for about four years now. And uh, it's great. It's been getting great. From the moment we did the first one, it, it, it's it's been getting great feedback. So. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know this is uh, going to be asked, but um, I was going to ask you um, the, the sort of PPMs, the P phenol parts per million in the barley mm -hmm. that you use. Um, we, we, we would say about 25 uh, as a guide, but the what you've got here is a, a vatting from different years because this was because this was a sort of experiments really when we first sat down to taste the cask from different years the the pt levels varied from year to year so to do a batch we we marry a few different years together um we're not we didn't set out to do a set recipe so um the ppm might change slightly from batch to batch um mm -hmm. you know we would send it away to get analyzed at tatlock to get the full the full figures probably mm -hmm. um but the barley spec is to be around that sort of level so mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah i mean you can definitely get the i call it kind of it's kind of feels like sort of heathery peat you know it's not it's not coastal peat it's there's something quite floral about it yeah we we were i mean our, our new make spirit's pretty floral anyway and we were anxious that we didn't want to to do a, a kind of Isla approximation. There's a mm -hmm. lot of things in our, if you like, our unpeated whiskies that we would have that we wanted to try and to to, to keep with the the peated one. Mm -hmm. So the barley, I think, the peat they use is from the northeast of Scotland. So it's 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 Highland rather than so less salt, less brine, less iodine. Mm -hmm. um, but the smoke is still there with the sweetness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And would you take yours with a bit of water? Um, this one I would. Some of our whiskies, I mean, we were quite surprised. We started doing uh, our forays into cash strength came as a result of the Spirit of Speyside Festival because we would do a festival bottle every year, which was usually a single cask mm. up at kind of fifty eight percent. And we were surprised that the the sweetness and the subtleties kind of still stay there even at that high strength, which is different to to some other whiskies. Mm -hmm. um, but we always suggest with the cash strength a little bit of water we're over 60 percent on this particular one um yeah. so the good thing about this is though if you've got your little um got my little pipette there you get more of an excuse to sort of tailor the whiskey to suit your own palate because everybody yeah. everybody's going to have a different uh palate and that might even change from day to day depending on the person so absolutely uh, Absolutely. Cash strength whiskies can be a lot of fun that way. It's not about <laughs> it's not about how big the number is. It's it's you yeah. know you can it's a lot easier to create your own favourite whiskey from this than it is from a starting at a lower point and going up. I think. So. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I don't know if you find this, but certainly when adding water to peated whiskies, I always find it underlines the and encourages the peat smoke out of the glass. So I'm gonna. I don't have my pipette, unfortunately. <laughs> I've got a reasonably steady hand today for some reason. I've had, I've no right to, but there you there you go. No, you're, you're right about that. The smoke when you add the water, the smoke. Yeah. I imagine it's been cooped up in this bottle for a while. So. Um, yeah. Really. Bad. Anything at kind of sixty percent, the alcohol is a fairly dominant uh, character, so it might be masking a few more flavors. I get a real kind of lemon and lime zest. Coming out, you know, like almost like this, when you're smelling opal fruits or tasting mm -hmm. opal fruits, like the yellow or the green, and it really makes your mouth water. So before I even taste that, my mouth's salivating and good, good. You know, looking forward to it. You know. Yeah, I mean, they, we do. We were doing virtual tastings this year as well because we were all locked down from the 
the distillery. Mm-hmm. And the amount we ask people to do the, to, to, to tell us their tasting notes as they go. Yeah. Um, yeah. We discovered that it was sometimes better to, to, to ask the guys that are attending these festivals what they think of the tasting notes rather, rather than bringing a, a writer or a consultant Oh, to write the tasting note for us. We had some amazing ones, but quite often you get vanilla, you get fruit, you get tropical notes. Um, yeah. yeah. Somebody even yeah. told us they thought it, it reminded them of a balmy summer's evening in Blair Gowrie, which I've got no idea. I've never been in Blair Gowrie when it's been sunny. So, um, <laughs> try that, so. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm always... Uh, in, in you know all the activities that we do and it's, it's slightly more difficult online but face to face and you've got a group of people in front of you and you know some some new new people to whiskey and they're not quite sure you know what to say about the whiskey and to be honest it, it really comes down to one question and you know do you like it yeah yeah and everything else is just a, a branch from that yeah if you don't like it then there's no point in going any further but if you do like it you know why do you like it you know what does it remind you of you know just very simple questions to ask yourself and yeah and then occasionally people will come up with wonderful things like a sunny afternoon in Blair Gary you know it's just it does whiskey makes you reminisce and that's what I love about it totally and uh, it's something the wine trade did very well Think back to the 1990s when the Australian and the Chilean wine, I, mm-hmm. I started with an American winery back in the 90s. Mm-hmm. Um, and they were pushing education. They were all, they were hitting every tasting. They were, you know, you had Jilly Golden on TV. People were were getting really wrapped about her taste. Yeah. It was yeah. all wine related. Yeah. And I think they translate so well to whiskey and they take a lot of that fear out and they give people a little bit more confidence mm-hmm. uh, because we want them to find something they enjoy. So. That's right. I, I love hearing what people think of these things. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly, exactly. Now, listen. While we're enjoying that uh, dram, and I, I can confirm, I am enjoying this dram. It, well, for me, it's like it is like a, a, a summery peated whiskey, which I think is quite a rare thing. You know, m- yeah. most peated whiskies, um, a lot of people would regard as drams. They might approach it at the winter time, you know, in, in front of a roaring fire and all that kind of thing. And I kind of go along with that a little bit, but. Um, but this for me is a summary um, uh, peated dram. Um, but while we're enjoying that, do you want to just tell us a, a wee bit about the distillery and, and a bit of the history and, and so on behind it? Yeah, well, the distillery is the distillery is fantastic. Actually, it's it's got there's two different threads to the story. Um, the distillery, the physical distillery itself, started production in 1990, which was probably not the best time to start a distillery. If anybody remembers how many distilleries were closing down in Scotland at that time. Uh, it was built, original original builder was George Christie, who was a well-known whiskey blender, and he owned the North of Scotland Green Distillery, the Scots Selection labels and things like that. Um, this was his weekend thing. It took him 25 years to get the distillery built, and it started in 1990, um, straight into a recession. Uh, so they survived through the 90s by... You know, they, they fought their way through. They sold a lot of casks out to independent bottlers and things like that. Um, and then the second thread comes in because the chap that owns the distillery now was buying casks from them in the from the late 90s onwards. Uh, he owned the Spay brand, which he had launched as a kind of non-declared distillery range in Taiwan. And he bought the distillery in 2012, which then allowed us to kind of merge the two Threads and Spay became a distillery bottling rather than uh, rather than a, a no name uh, distillery brand. So, that was short and sweet. I wasn't expecting you to. <laughs> I, go on. I mean, the, the, the chap owns it now. It's quite funny because he's from the north of England. Actually, he's not far from you. He lives. He, he was born in Durham. Uh, his family go back. To, he's like the sort of 11th generation of the Harvey family, and I think the third generation of the ones that built Brickladdy. So this became, I think, the first distillery that any member of the Harvey family had actually owned for about 80-odd years. Um, but by owning the distillery, uh, we can then develop the Spade range, which 
this is what you see in Europe and the rest of the world is totally different from what he had been selling in Taiwan up to that point. Mm -hmm. He used to live in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, you know, that's when we started doing peated whiskey. That's when we started looking at cast strength and single casks, something that we'd never done before mm -hmm. that. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good stuff. And um, in terms of the production process, is there anything, any little tidbits of information you can give us that perhaps set you apart from from you know anyone else is there any little uh foibles yeah i mean it's a fairly traditional distillery if anybody sees uh goes to our website and th there's pictures of the the still house things everything's really under one roof it's a very small distillery it's two stills uh and they're in the same room as the washbacks and the mash tun um but we have a slow uh, uh slow distillations uh, fermentation time is up at 120 hours, which is considerably higher than a lot of distilleries. And I think that contributes to that, uh, or our distillery manager reckons that contributes to the the floral, the, the, the lightness that, that comes through in lots of our whiskies. Um, so that's probably the, uh, the thing that surprises most people, because there's not many distilleries that go beyond 120 hours um, I think Glenallic are now up at 140. Wow. But, I mean, previous distilleries I've worked for, it's 72 or, or, or mm. 85 and things like that. So. Or shorter, yeah. I mean, there's some around 36, 40, 48. Mm -hmm. 120 is definitely pushing it. Um, would, I, would I be right in also saying that you guys are... You, you tend to use slightly less active casks, so... Um, you like it, you know. Part of the reason I, I like the whiskey you guys make is that it you can really taste the distillate character, it's not shrouded in, in oak. Um, and it seems to be a, 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 um, a theme that runs through your bottlings. Is that is that some is that a, 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 a you know, a there's elements of that, yeah. There's elements of that. I mean, Finley, our distillery manager, joined us a couple of years ago now. Um, and is very close to to some of the cooperages we are we are now working with, but um, if you manage to taste any of the bottlings that came out of this distillery in the nineteen nineties, uh, when it was a brand new distillery, it was brand new casks, it was a completely different character. Um, this one in particular, the bottling we've got is it, it, it's ex bourbon, probably a high concentration of, of of refill and second fill because I think virgin oak or brand new wood would maybe put too much of that oak character in to this really delicate spirit um but it also means that when we you know we, we do quite a few cask finishes now and normally when we do that the cask finish casks will be the ones that bring in the the, the bigger kick the actual maturation cask for the the ex bourbon um we prefer that kind of delicate a more delicate sort of uh, input from those mm. I think I think that's a, it's, a, it's an interesting policy because um, a lot of distilleries will use much more vociferous casks to begin with, and and possibly not achieve quite the same um, change, alteration, mutation, whatever you want to call it, when it's being finished in a sherry cask or a Madeira cask or whatever it mm -hmm. might be. So that's quite interesting, actually. But I, I certainly, you know, highly recommend this whiskey or you know your whiskeys particularly to those that want to really drill down to the distillate character because like you say you can really taste the, the the you know fresh floral fruity flavors which uh you know certainly contributed by the uh, uh very long fermentation um so what about in terms of um the future for for space side what's what's the what's what's what does the future hold oh that's 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 a given what's gone on this year that's a an amazing question actually Eddie. Um, we announced in January that we had uh, that we were going to open a second distillery um, to allow us, I mean we, we, we do most of our work, our export work in, in Asia um, and we wanted to to look at a, a, a second distillery so we could increase production and, and, and all the all the other things. Um, I think it was last month uh, what a lot of people don't know is we, we own the distillery, we own the warehousing, the barrels, etc., etc. but we didn't actually own the land. We're tenants on that 
plot of land where our distillery is. So uh, we're tenants there until 2025. And then in 2025, another company will take that site and build their own distillery there. So we will move to this second distillery. So we've got, you know, the next few years of some fantastic plans of it. Um, but there will be a new distillery from 2025 onwards. So, Wow. No, no pressure then. No pressure. Um, I don't know if you... I think the original, you know, when we announced that we were going to do a second distillery, um, you know, we, we've been... John took over the company in 2012. We've been on that site since then. Um, and whether... I don't know whether the, the discussion was whether we could extend that or take over the land or whatever... But well, ultimately, we'd, we'd looked at the second site. We, we've got that announced. We've not announced the location yet, but um, I've seen some of the plans, and they're really good. But it's not going to be a second distillery now. In 2025, we will move uh, and commence production on a, on a new right. site. So. Right. So then you'll have to look for another site for the second distillery. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Maybe. I don't know. So tell me. I really, I really want to see what, what uh, the new guys the new guys do with the site when we leave it because it's a it's an absolutely gorgeous little place it's like a little hidden uh hidden gem it's tucked down a wee country road it's really hard to find um the chris george christie really found a little idyllic spot and mm. it was never ever open for for visitors so i you know i really want to see what they can do with it so yeah so tell me will you take um the distilling equipment with you to the new site um, well, that that's ours. We don't we don't have the land, but uh, everything else, you know, when the when the company changed owners, when John's company took over in 2012, we got the old Christie warehouse, which was the Rutherglen Bond at the time, mm -hmm. um, the stocks and, and the distilling hardware. So I saw, I think Whiskey Magazine had reported that um, the distilling equipment will come with us. So lots of questions that haven't been answered yet. Mm -hmm. We've still got a few more years to figure out. Exactly. What, <laughs> well, you say that do. they'll they'll soon go. I tell you, there's there's the kind of sort of the amount of sort of um, engineering companies that are sort of speculatively messaging messaging the office now, hoping to talk to us about things that we want to do in a couple of years' time that are, are increasing all the time now. So, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I imagine there will be a pile of catalogues of pipe work and distilling equipment. <laughs> it's not my end of the business, but yeah. it's going to be a lot of fun to be had. So Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and lastly, Paul, um, I just wanted to ask you, as a you know someone who's been in the industry a while, you know, is there, what, what do you think of the current state of the whiskey industry? Is it in rude health? Um, and, it, you know, are there any exciting developments beyond you guys obviously moving in 2025? You know, perhaps in the in the wider whiskey world that excites you. There's the overall health of the industry. I'm not. There's there's been a couple of hurdles this year. Obviously, the the, the Brexit thing and, and COVID has has affected everybody. But I really like what a lot of the new distilleries are doing. There's so many. I I, I hope um, we see much more of that, not just from Scotland, but you know, you've got distilleries coming from places I never knew. There were distilleries at before um and everybody you know each country's got different sets of regulations they're, they're, they may be distilling to different templates but i love being able to find out what what they're doing and some of these international some of these world distilleries are getting amazing results like milk and honey and and um Cavalan are two perfect examples um they've really put their own countries distilling on the map um Two of my distributors around the world, and one in Lithuania and one in Switzerland, own their own distilleries as well. And the things those guys are doing are, are you know, we'll see them in a couple of years' time, but but they're doing fantastic things as well. Uh, and I think the world of uh, folk that enjoy whiskey now are much more interested in things that are going on without outside of Scotland as well. There's, I was speaking to somebody from an English distillery the other day because we share a distributor. Um, and he told me there were 33 distilleries in England now, mm. which might shock some of the old, the old tartan Scotsmen up north. But <laughs> I think that's fantastic. And there's, you know, Pinderon have just opened their second distillery. And that's right. There's now, there's now over, I think there's now over 30 in France. Yeah, yeah. My, 
road trip round distilleries in the future is going to be intercontinental. I'm absolutely positive of that, and I want to, I can't wait to see what we can do. So, absolutely, no, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, but anyway, Paul, listen, it's been lovely to talk to you, albeit you know rather brief, but you know that's that's the gig. Um, yeah. Thanks once again for providing the uh, delicious Fumar cask strength. I hope everyone at home has enjoyed it and still enjoying it. And um, look forward to seeing you in person at a real festival at some point. Oh, I can't wait for that. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I've been drinking my own whiskey for a year now. I miss being able to go to somebody else's table yeah. and help myself to another distillery's drink. <laughs> I know, I know. Well, it's it's going to happen. It's going to happen, mate. Anyway, listen, Paul. Thanks so much, and uh, I will see you very soon. I'm sure. Cheers, Thanks. Eddie. Thank you, everybody. Uh, Slange and um, enjoy the rest of the festival. Make sure you get some good drams out of it. So oh, I'm sure they will. Slange, Paul. Cheers.